So all guests on Zaslow Show 2.0 brought to us by the official beer of the program, Johnny Cuba. European roots with that Caribbean soul, a refreshing German lager in a can. You can pick up a six-pack of Johnny Cuba. Get yourself ready for tonight. Heat and nuggets. You go to your local Sedanos, Presidente, Winn-Dixie, Fresco y Moss. You always drink responsibly. And, of course, don't forget Johnny Cuba's mantra. Stay tranquilo. Heat nuggets tonight. It's a national TV game. It's a national radio game. ESPN Radio tonight. Mark Kestesher, PJ Carlissimo on the call tonight from Denver. Mark Kestesher joining us here. Always good having you on this show, Mark. Uh, thanks for hanging out with us. Does it feel like a finals rematch tonight? It's funny. When I was here in Denver during the spring last year, the run-up to the playoffs, I was missing that kind of civic pride feeling. And then it came out, obviously, during the finals. Um, I think something's missing just a little bit. You know, maybe it's because it's so late in the season. It's been eight and a half months. And in our age of uh, technology, when eight and a half minutes later, we don't remember what we were talking about before and arguing about, uh, you know, sometimes it feels like, oh, was that last year's finals? Uh, but they're going to meet twice, you know, here down the stretch, one more time coming up in Miami. I think also to add to that, you know, even though Denver's 40 and 19, you know, there's still some questions about the second unit they still have the same starting five and the heat of course feels like we're in that same position again where i'm not quite sure what we have but they're tough and on this road trip they've been tough and maybe you know they can make another uh, legendary run in the eastern conference but i think the long answer is you know there'll be some pomp and circumstance tonight but it doesn't have that you know feeling like opening night in the nba when the last two champs or the teams that contested for the championship meet up I totally agree. I, I think what's I think what's happening tonight, so the Heat have a chance to sweep this road trip. And I have felt leading up to now-ish that there's going to be a moment in the season where the Heat are going to make a run and everyone is going to start looking and pointing at the Heat and saying, look at them. We haven't been talking about them. And they're back and they're doing their thing. I think if the Heat win tonight, they would sweep a road trip. It's late in the year. It's defending champs. It's a national game. I think if they win tonight, we would have that kind of discussion nationally about the Heat. And if they don't win tonight, then I think we're just going to keep it our secret here in South Florida. <laughs> I kind of agree. It, it, it's reminiscent of what happened in Los Angeles last night. I think a lot of the national discussion now is, oh, the Lakers, you know, it's almost the same kind of fit. They had the run last year like Miami had in the other conference and LeBron goes off in the great fourth quarter. And, um, you know, on a night, on a day, that's a little light in an NBA schedule. That's getting a lot of buzz before the game. But I think you're right. Um, and Miami's not even whole yet. That's the interesting part. We don't know if we're getting Tyler Hero back tonight. Uh, Terry Rozier just came back. Josh Richardson is still out. Kevin Love's going to be out tonight. Um, we're waiting to hear about Jamal Murray, too. You know, he's dealing with some shin splints and didn't play the back end of a back-to-back -back last week. But I think you're right. If Even though it's a late game on the East Coast, if this goes Miami's way and you're talking about six straight wins and a perfect February on the road coming home for a game against Utah and it's still in the – 24-hour talk cycle, but the Monday through Friday talk cycle, a Friday morning, you're right. I think you get a little bit of traction, like, let's take a closer look at what Miami's doing. How much of the Heat have – how many games for the Heat have you done this year? This will be uh, my second, and unfortunately, I was in Miami when the Celtics probably played their best game of the year. I think it was Terry Rozier's second game. Uh, and there were still some injury issues. But, uh, you know, I, I watch them on the league pass all the time, but only have uh, been there once live. Give me some uh, give me some thoughts here just overall on Jimmy. You know, he – whether you like it or not, he really does seem to be the kind of guy who really cruises the first half of the season. And then we get to late in the year, and he really – he's one of those guys that has a switch. And – you saw when he got thrown out of the game in New Orleans a couple of games ago, and he was taunting jokingly with the crowd, it's that time, it's that time. And <laughs> I, it really seems like for Jimmy, it's that time of year where he's going to turn it on and take things serious. Yeah, it's not like, it's not a way I like to operate personally and probably other players like to operate personally, but yeah. some people just know, you know, what the value is of the season, what they need to do to get ready for the second season. 
Uh, do you want to be in the best position possible? Yes. And I think, you know, sitting fifth as we talk right now with a chance to even, you know, maybe climb another spot, you know, who knows what's going to happen with the Knicks while they're waiting on their injured players to come back. Um, and Philadelphia, of course, without Joel Embiid for who knows how long. So I, I think, you know, a lot of times we look every day at standings and we project, you know, what are the matchups going to be? Who, we want to stay away from uh, the four or five, right? Because then you get Boston. I think guys like Jimmy Butler and even LeBron James, you know, bringing his name back in. I remember in his Cleveland days, maybe not as much when he was in Miami, but in the, the second Cleveland tour, it was always like, yeah, this is all just we're getting ready for April 15th or April 20th, whenever the playoffs start. I never fear that Jimmy Butler is not going to be able to answer the bell. Um, you know, and last year we saw last time we saw him here in Denver. I mean, it was it was the end of a great run. And you could see, you know, he had given every last ounce and he came back from suspension, had a good game the other night. I suspect uh, he'll be. Uh, uh, you know, ready for tonight's game and wanted to show out on a, on a big stage. But you're right, until until that second season begins, we don't get the vintage Jimmy Butler. Can you, re- can you recall a more improbable best player in the league than Nikola Djokic? <laughs> uh, man, that's a great question because it's not a one-hit wonder. I mean, he's now done this for four straight years, and you could probably even go back a year before that. I mean, you could argue... You know, he should be three-time reigning MVP with another one coming up. The thing that's amazing to me is not that he looks unathletic, but he looks unathletic. (laughs) When you Mm -hmm. see him up close, when you interview him. I don't even know if he likes basketball. You know, he does. If It's a great act because he does not like to talk about himself. He doesn't like to talk about the game like it's anything more than his job. I think there's much more pride in there than he shows, but... Uh, PJ and I, you know, often ask players when, uh, you know, we're in all-star settings or in the in-season tournament, like, who's the toughest guy to guard? And I would say nine times out of ten, it's that big guy in Denver, Nikola Jokic. He's just a mountain of a man. You can't move him. Um, He's got eyes on all sides of his head. So when you think you got him, he's got a way out and he gets others involved. And, uh, you know, he could stroke the three-pointer as well. So, it's uh, it is unlikely. I love the fact that uh, ESPN was in a Taco Bell commercial when he was drafted. That just adds to the lore, and um, it is pretty remarkable. And he's uh, uh, he's right at the height of his powers right now. Couldn't even get mad during the finals last year because you know we're, we're watching the games down here, and like he's just impossible. That was that was just the feeling when I'm watching the game and he has the ball. This guy is impossible, and there's nothing we could do about it. It, it really really need an off night, and he doesn't have many of them. And I think we even saw in the finals in that last game in the clincher in game five where he wasn't shooting the ball well, but then the next thing you know, he's got 10, 11 assists, so it doesn't yeah. matter. Um, yeah, he's a problem. He's a problem for a lot of teams. I'm interested to go talk to Michael Malone. We had them opening night here when they raised the uh, the banner. We had them Christmas Day here as well. So this will be my third time and another little benchmark. You know, they're in game 60 right now just to find out how he feels about beyond the starting five. Because I think that's the big question mark for me in the Western Conference race that feels wide open. If you want to give the benefit of the doubt to teams who've been there before, like the Nuggets and like the players on the Clippers and not so much for Oklahoma City and Minnesota. You know, I want to know, even though Jeff Green and Bruce Brown are not names that people talk about, they were tremendously important last year. And I don't know if the young guys have answered that question as of now. How impressed are you with uh, with the Celtics? Uh, are they, I mean, I know as far as a lead goes, I think they're eight up, or maybe eight and a half up. Well, eight, because Cleveland lost last night. Boston didn't play. So I think they're eight up on Cleveland right now. Uh, are they far and away the best team? Or, you know, do you need a seed in the playoffs? I think, um, you know, for me, they're far and away the best team. But you're right, of the regular season. Uh, We had them Saturday night in New York. Tim Legler was actually my analyst Saturday night, and he said he's the best team, obviously, he's seen this year. He goes, but they are beatable. He goes, the one thing that's different this year than in years past is less and less reliance on the three. They do rely on the three ball quite a bit. But uh, against the Knicks in that first half when they shot nearly 70%, you know, the Knicks were running them off the three-point line, and they were killing New York 
on two point shots and they were taking advantage of mismatches. So they seem like um, Tatum and Brown are in a really smarter era of their careers. They're veterans now. Um, you bring in Chris Stapps Porzingis, who, you know, many people thought wasn't even in the league anymore. He was in Washington and having a great resurgent year, and he's brought that to Boston. And to me, when they traded Marcus Smart, I figured uh, they're taking a step back because one of their hallmarks is defense. And I don't think anyone could have foresaw the Lillard trade and the fact that, you know, Portland then ships Drew Holiday to Boston, and it makes them so complete. I'm not hugely sold on their second unit either, um, but of all the teams that I've seen this year – they're the closest, this is my compliment to them, of the heyday Golden State Warriors. Their pace, their space, their ability to move without the ball and, and pass the ball around and get an even better shot than they would have, uh, to me, is what uh, you know sets them apart. But you're right, the playoffs are a different animal. Uh, they made it to the finals one time two years ago. They've had problems with the Heat over the years in many Eastern Conference finals that we know of. Um, so they still they're still going to have a little bit of a – a gorilla on the back until they uh, get that championship number 18. The Lakers and Warriors are 9 and 10 in the West. So they'd have to win multiple playoff games, multiple play-in games uh, to, to just qualify for the postseason. Are you willing to say that one of them, if not both, will miss the playoffs entirely? I think they're safe. I think Utah uh, kind of falling apart here of late, sitting 11th right now, helps them out. Um uh, I, I think it'll be a, for us, we do the 9-10 play-in games. So to have a Warriors-Lakers play-in, yeah. which I, I think, didn't we get that in the first year of the play-in in the, the post-bubble, the first post-bubble year? I'd have to do some research on that. But I figure we've never had a play-in game like this before. And I think we might have had uh, Steph versus LeBron in that. But either way, um, the West is fascinating to me because there's still enough room to make some difference, to get out of the 9-10 to maybe get up to the six. You know, Dallas was in the seven through 10 at one point. They've had their little run. Now they're in the five, six portion. Um, but it just goes to show you that there's going to be a lot of work to do at the bottom of the Western Conference. There's there's no guarantees. I think everybody's hoping you get Oklahoma City or Minnesota in the first round. And, uh, you know, maybe there's an advantage to you being an older team. Uh, the way those two teams, though, have played this year, you know, be careful what you wish for, especially with Oklahoma City, who virtually, you know, nobody, unless you're a hoop head, has any idea what's going on in OKC right now. But it's special. Um, so to me, the West lays out amazingly. And, you know, the thought to have Golden State and the Lakers in a one game winner take all or winner advance to play another play in game just sounds very delicious. Do you uh, do you think there's a problem in the league with the offense? You know, we saw the story a couple days ago that. The competition committee is going to be trying to address whether or not they should make any type of changes defensively, slow down some scoring. Do you think that there's a problem? I think uh, I, for the most part, fans love scoring. I think the biggest problem for me, I don't mind the games getting into the 130s. It's the amount of 50-point games and 40-point games, you know, of separation, blowouts that are very concerning. Uh, it'd be interesting to see what kind of drag they could put on scoring because the way they opened it up, as we recall from the nineties was they took away the defense's teeth. I mean, you can't put your hand on anybody coming through the lane. Uh, the only thing that's changed is the amount of three pointers that are being taken now. And that's where the interesting people far smarter than me would have to come up with how you drag down scoring because teams shoot 53 pointers a night and don't even think twice about it. You know, in the old days, there were a handful of teams that did that. And you're like, Look at these guys shooting threes and dunks and layups, and that's it. There's no more mid-range. So I think they will have to take a look at it. They may have to give the defense, um, you know, a little something. But it's the the blowouts that concern me more than the games that get into the 130s and 140s. MVP of the league right now is who? I think uh, it's, to me, it's Jokic or Shea Gilgis-Alexander. And I think Doncic has to be in there, too. So I'm not, I'm sitting on the fence, but I think right now I would lean Jokic, just how he dominates for this team. Um, you know, they're still top three right now in the West. Uh, I don't know if Gilgis Alexander will get enough love in the, you know, the market that he's in or the lack of national games that he plays. Uh, I think Dallas being on an uptick helps Luka, uh, but I think I'll stick with Jokic for now. Finally, I want to ask you, Mark, uh, you did the All-Star Weekend. You did All-Star <laughs> Saturday night. 
how hard is it to call the dunk contest on the radio? How do you describe <laughs> the dunks? What do you do? It is the hardest thing I do all year. And it comes after we call like 700 three-point shots in the yeah. three-point contest, which I love. I love the three-point contest. Steph and Sabrina was awesome. I always say this every year. Think figure skating. And the great figure skating announcers in Olympic history always have the program in front of them. We know when the uh, triple sow cow is coming and the double toe loop. We have no idea what's coming. So to your point, you're ready for anything. Uh, you know, a prop comes out and, you know, I'm in my mid fifties now. My daughter, you know, is in her mid twenties and she's like, how did you not know who the guy was who's sitting in the chair? And I'm like, right. cause I'm a dinosaur. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I just try to stay limber linguistically, hope the right words come to mind, but it's not one of my strong points, but we, we have a lot of fun doing it. It's such a weird event to do. Uh, <laughs> tonight, Mark has assured PJ Carlissimo heat and nuggets ESPN radio. Excellent job as always, Mark. I appreciate you stopping by with us here on the show. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jonathan. Always good to be on with you.